the Rabbeinu Shalom changed a day that was meant to be full of so much Simcha. The day of Shemini Atzeres, the day of Simcha's Torah, into one of the most saddest, painful days that anyone here has ever experienced in their lives. Perhaps there's a message that specifically on the day that's supposed to be Kuloi La Hashem, Shemini Atzeres is a day that we spend together with the Rabbi Nishalolim, there's no mitzvahs we spoke about. That's the day that happened, all these tragic events. And just a few days ago, we stood right here in this space of Medrash, by Ni'ilah, pleading for our lives, begging that it should be a good year, it should be a happy year, it should be a safe year, it should be a successful year. Little did we know, little did we know in just a few hours after that Ni'ilah, what was being planned and how many people's lives got totally changed within just a few moments. I'm sure everybody by now has seen some of the images, pictures and videos that are circulating around. Mothers being dragged away, people being shot point blank, bodies, dead bodies being dragged in different directions, body bags lined up, not one, two or three, but tens and tens of body bags. Children, young innocent children, looking completely petrified. Stories of rape, of women being paraded around without any clothes on. Families, whole families being wiped out in a matter of seconds. There's no memory of that family ever again. We haven't heard of something like this since the Holocaust. There has not been something like this since World War II. Children, sights, videos and pictures of children, young little babies being locked in cages. Where do you see such a thing, such cruelty? I spoke this evening to someone who's in one of the one of the territories that's in a very dangerous place. As I'm speaking to him, you can hear the rockets falling. You can hear the sounds of the explosions. And he said that they had just caught, literally minutes before I spoke to him this afternoon, they had just caught four terrorists that were running around his settlement. Ramosha Sternberg Schlita clearly said last night, every single one of us is in a matzav of Sakona. We have no idea how far this can go. That was, that was the word of Ramosh Sternberg Shlita. And he said, Avadi, we have to be talking in the Rabbi Yisraelim, but we have to do our Ishtadlas. We have to do something. You know, once again on Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur we read in the afternoon by Musaf, the Asura Yerugi Malchus, the ten that were killed in such a barbaric, tragic way. And we read about Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, and we read it over here in the Machsa, in this very base of Medrash, as did everyone else on Yom Kippurim, about how they killed Rabbi Akiva. They took the iron combs and they combed his flesh off. And as they reached the Mokrei Matfilin on his head, the Malachim screamed out and said, Zu Teira, Zu Shara, how can this be? This is Rabbi Akiva. This is our Rabbi Akiva that taught Teira to Klal Yisrael. Without Rabbi Akiva, where would we be? And this is the reward. This is the end of Rabbi Kiva's life. You know, the Rabbi Nishalaylam answered, the Medrash tells us, we read it again over here in the Machsa. The Medrash says, Chazal tell us that the Rabbi Nishalaylam told the Malachim, stop, because if you want to understand, I'm going to have to turn the world back into nothing. I'm going to have to destroy the world and recreate it. What does that mean? What, 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 how do you understand that? The Vilna Goin explains Pshat as follows. He says, imagine if a person is a very wealthy guy, he has beautifully, has silk, gorgeous silk, and he takes it to one of the finest tailors. And he says, I'd like you to make me a custom suit, 
beautiful, gorgeous suit. Takes his measurements this way, that way, where the button's gonna be, where the pocket's gonna be. It's gonna look gorgeous. This is the top, top tailor. This is the top guy. He knows how to make the most beautiful suit. Gives the beautiful silk material to the tailor. Tailor says, come back in two weeks. And he works day and night. He comes back, he sees this magnificent suit. Never saw anything like it in his life. It's gorgeous. He puts it on, it fits like a glove. It's gorgeous, it's amazing, it's perfect. He says, thank you very much. He pays the guy and he goes home. He comes in, he comes into his house. He said, my dear wife, what do you think of my new suit? She says, I cannot believe it. You got gypped. What, what do you mean? He's stolen half of that material. You know how expensive that material is? He stole half of it. He didn't use all that material on your suit. He's stolen half of it and he's gonna sell it to others at a profit. He's gonna make a fortune. How could you allow him? The guy was furious. How can he do this to me? He marches back to the guy. He says, chutzpah, you didn't use all the material that I gave you for my suit. He said, of course I did. No, you did not. He says, I did. He said, and they started arguing backwards and forwards. Until the tailor says, you want me? I'll, I'll show you. Take off your jacket. So he takes off the jacket and he starts ripping some of the stitches. The guy's like, what are you doing? He's like, hold on a minute. You want to see? Hold on. And he starts ripping it apart. And as he's ripping this area and he's ripping that area, all of a sudden you can see the extra folds that you couldn't have seen when it was a full finished suit. But only when he opened it up and ruined the suit, that's when he saw that all the material that he gave him was actually used. Says the Vilna going, the Rabbi Nishalaylam was telling the Malachim and ultimately us. The Rabbi Nishalaylam was saying, you want to understand why I do things? You're not going to understand. I'm going to have to rip the world apart and put it back together again just to show you why I did what I did. How many times do we have these questions and we think to ourselves, why? This doesn't make any sense. How can the Rabbi Nishalaylam do this? Avinu of Harachamon. The Rabbi Nishalaylam is the Abba Rachamim. He has all the Rachmanis in the world. And we've said so many times, he loves us as a child greater than a father can ever love a child. How can he do this? Hundreds and hundreds of people who were living a few days ago are no longer living. People that lost parents, children, siblings, Families wiped out and those that are injured, thousands of them, critically, seriously. That doesn't mean a small injury, it means that their lives could be different forever. In a matter of a few hours, how can the Rabbi Nishalayim do this? Zuk Chazal, you'll never understand. If you came here tonight for answers, I'm not giving, to you, I'm not giving you answers. I don't have answers. I don't know if anybody has answers. We don't understand everything the Rabbi Nishalaylam does, but we know where it comes from. There's a Mordek Chovetz Chaim, where the Chovetz Chaim tells us that when the brothers came to Mitzrayim, they were bewildered. How did it, how did it make any sense that the ruler of Mitzrayim, the ruler of Egypt, seemed to know what's going on? He knows our order of ages. He knows this, he knows that piece of information, a father, he knows too much, what's going on? All of a sudden, Yosef says what? Ani Yosef. Ah, everything makes sense. Now we understand how they knew everything, how he knew this, how he knew that. Ani Yosef. Zog Chaim. That in this world we live in, we have so many questions. We don't understand why things are happening. We don't understand. It makes no sense to us. There'll be a time that the Rabbi Nishalaylam will stand up and say, Ani Hashem! And everything will make sense. All those situations that happened in our lives that didn't make any sense are going to make sense. And this is a question that Moshe Rabbeinu also suffered with as well. As the Medrash tells us in Shemais Rabbah, that Moshe Rabbeinu asked the Rabbeinu Shalolam Hareinu Nois Kavaydecha, which Chazal says to mean, he's asking, why is it that good people have bad lives? Why is it that bad people have good lives? The old age question that Moshe Rabbeinu asked the Rabbeinu Shalolam, please show me, what do I do? How does this make sense? It doesn't make sense, it's terrible, it's tragic. Moshe Rabbeinu asked of Hashem, and how did Hashem respond? Like, 
That means a human being cannot possibly comprehend anything. And that's even Moshe Rabbeinu. Anyone as holy as Moshe Rabbeinu, even Moshe Rabbeinu, could not possibly comprehend any action that the Rabbeinu Shalom did. And the Rabbeinu Shalom said, You'll see my back, but my face will never be seen. It says the Heidegger Sam Sofa. You know what that means? That means that sometimes the Rabbeinu Shalom brings on the world such suffering, such pain, such hardships, and we don't understand. But there will come a time that we will. And our job is to have the Emun and the Rabbeinu Shalom. Our job is to realize and recognize where everything comes from. I was in con contact a couple of hours ago with a soldier that told me he's in a very, very dangerous place. He said he can't tell me exactly where he is, but he's very, very close to a very dangerous place. That's all he was able to tell me. And this afternoon, one of the boys of Yeshiva said to me, Rebbe, what can I do? I, I want to do something. I want to do, I feel I want to do something. No, I can't go out and fight. But what can I do, Lemaisa? What can I do? So I asked this soldier, so tell me something. The boys want to know, what can they do? Is there anything that they can do? You know what he said to me? Now, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know who this is. Somebody gave me his number and said, Rebbe, call him up. He needs chizek and mabrocha before he... So I said, sure, no problem. I have no idea how religious, re yes, religious, not religious. I have no idea. But one thing I can tell you is what he said. When I asked him, what should the boys do? He said, please, tell them to put on tefillin for me. I don't have tefillin, and I cannot put tefillin on this place. Tell them to do a mitzvah for me. Something that I cannot do. He understood, and again, I don't know religious, not religious, but it doesn't really make a difference. He understood what a mitzvah is. He understood what an opportunity is as well. And that's unbelievable. And then he said something else. And then he said to me, you guys in the base medrash, you guys are fighting the war. That's what he said to me. This is the soldier that told me I can show you the message. He said to me, you guys are really doing this. I said, no. I said, we're partners. I said, we're doing our Ishtadlis, you're doing your Ishtadlis, and we leave the rest up to the Rabbi Nishalayla. And he said, I couldn't have put it better. That was his response. I spoke to a, another boy. I spoke to another soldier who was on his way up to the border to identify his cousin's body that was shot at the music festival on Simchas Torah. We were both crying on the phone. He had to identify the body. I said, what are you doing after that? He said, I'm going straight to the front. I have to serve. I have to protect. And I said, what do you want the boys to do? What do you want me to tell the boys? What could we do in yeshiva? Tell them to daven for me. That's it. Now, I know this boy very, very well. He's not the most religious boy in the world, to say the least. But he understood the koyach of tefillah. He understood what we need to do to help him. <coughs> That's what we have to do, Rabbi Say. If there's a war going on, there's a limited amount that we can do from a physical perspective. But there's a lot we can do from a spiritual, from an emotional, from a heart perspective. And we have to do our part. We cannot allow this opportunity to go by and just say, no, what's for lunch? Really? That's what it's all about? We cannot allow this situation to happen and us to go on as regular. We have to do something. We have to get up, we have to change, we have to become. This is the time. Perhaps, maybe this is why. On the day of Shemini Atzeres, on the day of Semchaz Torah, the day that we explain so many times, it's only us and Hashem. And the Rabbani Shem says, I just want you, I want your relationship, I want that connection. Maybe that's the wake up call. On that day, the day that we thought, yeah, everything's good. We're going to sit with the Rabbani Mishalaylam. We're going to have a Yom Tov, we're going to dance with the Torah. The Rabbani Shem says, hold on a minute. It doesn't always go in your control. Where's the heart? Where's the lave? Where's the geschmack? Where's the connection? And maybe this is going to propel us. And if it doesn't, then what a shame. We spoke, if you remember, when we were standing by the crematorium, one of the concentration camps, about so many of the parents that had lost their children, these kiddoshim, 
And one of them was Mrs. Bailey who said she lost her two sons, a terrorist attack, outside right by Ramot. And she said, please, I beg of you, she was speaking to all of thousands of people, do something. Because if you don't, then my two children that left the world will be leaving the world for nothing. If we're just the same people, and we daven the same Ma'ariv, and make the same Birch HaSamozoin, and we just do the same things, then wouldn't it help? Every single thing is a message. There is nothing in the world that the Rabbi Nishalalim does that's not a message for ourselves. And we cannot let this opportunity pass. We have to do something. We have to be machazik in our emunah. We have to machazik in the fact that we realize that everything comes to the Rabbi Nishalalim. And no, we don't understand. And it's so difficult and it's so painful and it's so tragic. And our heart and our tefillahs go out to every person that lost a family member, to every person that was injured, to any person that was affected. Remember the Rabbi Nishalalim has every single one of us in mind when this whole operation took place. He understood the repercussions, he understood our emotions, he understood our reactions. It was all part of the Cheshbon. But what are we going to do about it? Our job is to not let this opportunity pass, is to do something, is to get up and decide, yes, we need to do something. Let the day of Shemina Tzeres not just be remembered for the tragic events of what happened, but rather what we did in our lives to improve our Yiddishkeit and our connection. And even amongst the tragedies, and I'm sure they'll come out more and more, the stories of Nisim and Niflois, that somebody sent me a message this evening, I have no idea if this is on the news or not, but he told me that there was approximately 240 dead bodies in that music festival not including how many are dead or alive in Gaza that were taken away that they weren't sure at the time, maybe now it's changed. But the Israelis are taken back one specific place where there are many terrorists and they were running around freely but the Israelis came in but they were worried, they knew that there were terrorists. So they started to hide and they went into a drain pipe and in that drain pipe they found a whole group of Jewish children who were hiding over there from the festival to hide themselves from the terrorists that were Baruch Hashem alive. And I'm sure there'll be many, many, many more of these little snippets just to give us a little bit of a muna. That when Yosef at Sadiq went down to Mitzrayim, it was a terrible gzeira. It would cause terrible things. But as the Torah tells us, there was nice smelling spices. Why? Because even among sometimes when things are difficult, when things are hard, the Rabbi Shalom slips in. Just remember, I'm still here with you. I'm still holding your hand. I'm here. This needs to happen. We don't understand. We'll never understand, maybe also. But we do realize, number one, it comes from the Rabbi Nishalolam. And number two, there's a message. And we have to do something about it. I leave you with this one last Misa. A few years, not so long ago, they discovered in the Warsaw Ghetto a jar. And that jar had been buried quite deep into the ground in one of the houses in the Warsaw Ghetto. They opened it up and they found a note which was still intact. And over there he writes, my name is Yasala, I'm a Gera Chosid, and I write these lines as the Warsaw Ghetto is burning in flames. My wife, he writes, and one month old baby was killed in front of me. My three other children were killed last week. I'm left in the world with nothing. I'm on my final hours in this world. I'm not going to last much longer. I'm 40 years old. I served the Rabbani Shalom all my life to the best of my ability. My only request is that he should help me serve in Bechol Nafshecha or Bechol Ma'idecha. I can st say clearly and honestly that my emunah has not changed one bit. I believe in every single one of the 13 principles of faith. I believe in the Rabbi Nishalaylam fully. There is nothing that's changed. And he says, Rabbi Nishalaylam, you've done so much to me that I should be pushed away from you. You've done everything you can to distance our relationship, but Rabbi Nishalaylam, it's not going to work. I'm always with you. 
I'm always together with you and I always believe in you. That's something that you'll never take away from me. Can you imagine what that means? For someone that witnessed his entire family being wiped out in front of his eyes and there he is, full emuna and betochen in the Rabbi Yishalaylam. Why? Because even if we don't understand and even if it's so difficult, we know ultimately everything comes from the Rabbi Yishalaylam. And yes, it's tragic, and yes, we have to daven, and yes, we have to be kabbal to do things, and learn Torah and do mitzvahs as best as we possibly can. But to ultimately realize whatever is going on, we're under the shelter of the Rabbi Nishalaylam. He's running the show. And the more we're machazik in that, the more there's purpose to everything that happened. <laughs> Listen to more by Rabbi Avi Wiesenfeld. Visit 